Hey everyone, this is Dr. Paul Ralston from One Source Wellness and Chiropractic. I just had a discussion with Jimmy, and um, here's a we think, think we went over my screen talk that uh, I give, um, and we're going to go ahead and attach that here. So I'm going to go ahead and go over this with you guys. So six point five billion, six point five billion people in the world. The slide's incorrect; it says million, but. 2.5 million of them have cell phones. So that's a, that's a lot of people. Every, basically everyone has a phone. So I'm gonna go over some statistics here with everyone. So this is just a, like a, I would say a potpourri of stats um, that I've kind of come up with and researched. Um, these stats are uh, kind of, they're, they're no particular order. It's just kind of an intro to some of the, the tech screen addiction types of uh, nature of those slides. And uh, we'll be going over everything in, in detail in a minute. So China has identified internet, dis, uh, internet addiction disorder as its number one health crisis. So not cancer, not heart disease, not diabetes, uh, internet addiction disorder. Um, South Korea is actually known as the internet capital of the world. There's more internet usage in South Korea than any other country. Now, South Korea has opened up 400 tech addiction rehab centers, and they give, so in school, they give every student, teacher, and parent a handbook in which details the potential dangers of screens and technology. So they don't just give the, the kids their tablet. They actually give them a handbook and lets them know, hey, this is a, a device that you know can potentially have some uh, lead to some consequences. 97% uh, of American children between the ages of 2 and 17 play video games. So 97%, let's just say everybody, right? Um, so your kids are going to be doing this. Um, according to the manufacturers of the Call of Duty franchise, it's been played more than 25 billion hours, which is equal to 2.85 million years, uh, longer than human existence. Um, that is hard to imagine actually one third of pre-k children in the u.s have their own full feature tablet four out of five children surveyed this is one's really uh, disturbing if you have kids uh, even if you don't have kids it's disturbing four out of five children surveyed unable to tell the difference between adult and adult an adult and another child um, when talking to someone online okay average age of first exposure to pornography online is 11 and unfortunately, this number is continuing to decline. 54% of college age students, so half of them, uh, reported sexting as a minor. Now, if you're traveling, so this is, goes into texting and driving. If you're traveling 55 miles an hour down the highway and you look down at your phone for five seconds, you will essentially have traveled the length of a football field blind. National Safety Council reports that two out of three teens say they use apps while driving. So not looking at a text message or not uh, calling someone, actually engaging and using an app while they're driving. So Snapchatting and going down the road and things like that, super dangerous. Law enforcement officials estimate there are at any given time, 50,000 child predators online. And 69% of teens regularly receive online communications from someone they don't know and they don't inform their parents or their guardians about that uh, communication. Okay, one in 33 youth have received an aggressive sexual solicitation, meaning that a predator asked a young person to meet, they called a young person, or they sent them money or some other correspondence. 55% of teens have given out personal information to someone online that they don't know. And 22% of teens have lost their friendships with someone due to actions on social media sites. I, I don't know what the number is in adults, but it, it, around this time, um, this time in our country, I would say that number is probably ratcheted up even over 22%. Um, new research has found cortical thinning in children spending greater than seven hours of screen time per day. And people hear that stat and they go, oh, 7% um, or you know, or seven hours a day, well, that doesn't sound, that sounds like an excessive amount, but I've actually given this talk and I've had kids go, oh, seven hours a day? I I wish I only spent seven hours a day on my devices um, or playing games. I mean, we're talking people spend 15, 16 hours a day on devices and, and screens. 
Um, cortical thinning, of course, is a risk factor. That's what is shown in uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, and you know, early onset of you know, memory loss and things like that. The the, the frontal cortex that that thins. So not not a good not a good thing, especially not in children. Uh, children spending an average of two hours of screen time per day scored lower on aptitude tests. Okay, so eye addiction. So open-minded. So this is an interesting kind of thought here. Um, what puts us on the top of the animal kingdom is our sophisticated brain. That kind of, we, we uh, developed the ability to use tools, uh, multiple things that sets us apart from um, you know, other predators on, on the planet. Human brain takes about 25 years to mature. Um, most important part of that brain maturation process occurs when puberty begins. So this is a, a key time in our evolution in which the, the most important part of that brain maturation takes place. The biology of puberty makes the human brain uniquely fragile, making teens uh, in that puberty time particularly susceptible to addictions and mental illnesses. And unrestricted access to screens is driving the epidemic of depression, anxiety, and addiction, the likes of which we've never seen before. Okay. Now, many people are going to use the term abuse and addiction interchangeably, but there's definitely a difference. Okay, so abuse of a substance definitely can have negative health effects, but it generally abuse doesn't majorly disrupt someone's life. Addiction, on the other hand, is when you are continuing to, you know, um, do a behavior in the face of dire consequences like you know losing a job divorce um, even your own life so that's a, a key difference now addiction has the characteristic of stimulating the reward centers of the brain and repeated stimulation leads to a change in the actual functionality of the brain now from a neurobiological perspective uh, actually addiction is a nice flow through to anxiety and depression okay so serotonin and dopamine. So these are technically the only two things we enjoy. Dopamine is our motivating neurotransmitter. So it's what's released into the, uh, it's called the nucleus accumbens. That's considered your pleasure center when we perform an action that will satisfy our desire. This is an important evolutionary adaptation because the dopamine hit is a survival mechanism. Stimulating that dopaminergic pathway incentivizes essential biological functions such as reproduction and eating, the two things that we need to do to stay alive. Food and sex is good, thus we seek out these activities um, in order to activate that dopamine high. However, uh, natural dopaminergic activities such as eating and sex, they typically come after effort and then delay Whereas addictive behaviors such as uh, gaming, uh, drug use, uh, those kind of things provide an actual shortcut to this whole process. The pleasure centers in this case with uh, in a, something like gaming or drug use will become constantly flooded with dopamine, except there's no biological purpose for that dopamine. So unfortunately, we haven't evolved a way to handle this dopamine flood. So when someone becomes addicted, they experience a shutdown or reduction in dopamine in order to give the receptors actually a break and some relief. This results in the addicted person needing more of the behavior or substance to achieve that feel-good result. So research shows that people who are predisposed to addiction have lower baseline levels of dopamine, thus they feel greater sense of reward from dopaminergic activities. So in other words, um, a person that's kind of walking around with a lower baseline level of dopamine, every little thing that would stimulate them gives them a, a bigger bang um, than a person that say has a, a higher baseline level of dopamine without any stimulation. It take would take more of them to kind of get, um, you know, addicted to something. So various substances raise dopamine different uh, in different amounts. So chocolate can raise dopamine 50%. Sex can raise it 100%. Cocaine, 350 percent, and crystal meth, 1,200 percent. So it can be, you get an idea how uh, addicting some of those substances could be. So serotonin and GABA, these are two neurotransmitters. Serotonin is our calming feel-good hormone. 
And as, as soon as we receive our reward, what happens is we get so you get the reward from doing the activity or taking the drug or playing the game or whatever it may be. You get a shot of serotonin that actually is what allows you to enjoy that reward and feel good, whatever that reward may be. Along with that shot of serotonin, you get a shot of GABA, which is our main inhibitory neurotransmitter. It means it inhibits things. So think of your GABA as your brakes on the brain and dopamine is the accelerated. So both of these are about kind of on a daily basis, kind of halfway pushed down until you get a reward. And then the serotonin actually goes up, which will cause GABA to go up. And then that puts the brakes on everything, on the dopamine. So hypothetically speaking, let's just say we take the brakes off. Then you get a constant flood of dopamine with no real purpose. And because there's no reward, you get no serotonin to get, help you feel good. And because you get no serotonin, the GABA is attached to the serotonin to help regulate. So you get no regulation and you just got a constant flood of dopamine. Okay. Slides. So Dr. David Greenfield, he's an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Connecticut, has, has been quoted as saying, People are now carrying around a portable dopamine pump, which is your phone. And kids have basically been carrying it around for about the last 10 years. Pretty, pretty scary if you really think about what can happen with that. So briefly, video game addictions, pretty controversial. Uh, some people insist that, you know, it doesn't exist. Other people say, well, the person is likely to be easily aggravated by other things, too. So... Some, and then there's other people who say, yeah, it's absolutely for sure there's aggression tied to aggressive video gaming. Um, so I'll, I'll just go over a couple stats on there, a couple things to go with that. One of the ways that people get hooked on video games in the first place is known as variable reward scheduling. So video games are designed with a reward system that's totally unpredictable. You don't know when you're going to get the next kill or the next reward, let's say, and this constant tension, it's kind of a, a, a pull of not knowing when that is going to come. It kind of keeps you in the game. It keeps you kind of going. Um, same concept as a slot machine. The player will develop an unshakable faith that the next time is going to be the big hit, right? So um, with slot machines and these these things like that, you just keep going, and they actually do studies on on – this whole mechanism and they've taken people and put them in a slot machine. And when they remove the losses and you just keep winning and, and there's no, there's no loss people actually, it's interesting. They, they get tired of playing really quickly. Um, so it's that, it's that push and pull and not knowing when that's going to hit that really just grabs a hold of you tight. It's one of the most addicting things that there is because the executive control center of the brain really doesn't reach full development until 25 to let's say 30 years old, younger gamers are likely to ignore things like hygiene and eating and schoolwork and just pursue the games. So the video game violence, this is the one that's, I guess, would say more controversial. So they've done a couple uh, studies. So the one study, 60% of middle school boys and 40% of middle school uh, girls who played at least one M-rated video game, uh, hit or beat up someone as opposed to 39% and 14% respectively that actually didn't play. According to brain imaging research, playing violent video games led to measurable changes in certain frontal brain regions, particularly less activations, um, less activation in areas that control aggression, self-control and emotion, kind of this whole regulation mechanism that we have. This was after only one week of play. So there's also something called game transfer phenomena, and this is a really interesting um, phenomenon. Uh, I had never heard of it before. Uh, there's a great book. Uh, I'll put it in the notes. There's a slide at the end. Nick Nicholas Cardaris. Um, he is a really an expert. He's a complete black belt with um, addiction with screens and and especially with kids, and. Uh, from his book, which is phenomenal, it's uh, called Glow Kids, he goes over the game transfer phenomenon. And this is a when you have an auditory or visual hallucination that uh, a gamer experiences with prolonged gaming. And we're talking people are really, they can be playing these games for hours. Um, there's been 
anecdotes of people playing, let's say, World of Warcraft. I think that's one of the big computer games um, for, you know, 60, 70 hours wearing diapers and, and not even going to the bathroom and just really locked in. It's, it's insane. Uh, some gamers are unable to stop thinking about the game after stopping playing. Uh, others think that something from the game will happen in real life and they have dis uh, difficulty distinguishing between real life and the actual game. Fortunately, most of that game transfer phenomenon is short lived um, and it will kind of dissipate. But, you know, you take game transfer phenomena and then combine it with sleep deprivation and that can be magnified, you know, especially in younger children. OK, so sexting. Now we'll go over. So these are the sexting laws. So what is sexting? So sexting is a term for sending a sexually explicit image or a message via mobile phone. Sextortion is known as a felony crime that occurs when someone threatens to send your private sensitive information um, if you don't send them sexual images, provide sexual favors, or money. Happens way more than um, way more than people think. So I'm in Wisconsin, so I actually have the Wisconsin law uh, that I go over. So Wisconsin, uh, under the Wisconsin child por pornography law, it's illegal to possess or view a visual depiction of a child engaged in sexual conduct, including depictions sent via sex message or text message. It's also a federal crime to use a computer to ship, transport, receive, distribute, or reproduce uh, for distribution a depiction of a minor engaging in sexual explicit conduct or any material that otherwise constitutes child pornography. It's another federal crime to promote or solicit sexually explicit material involving a minor. So even if a teen is uh, prosecuted for sexting in juvenile court, the punishment can be up to $10,000 and three and a half years in jail. And an adult who possesses or views child pornography, including sex messages, can face a $100,000 fine, 20 years in jail, or both. In addition, an adult punished under Wisconsin state laws for sexting with a minor may have to register as a sex offender. Uh, a sex offender. And as many people know, having to be on that sex offender list is, a, is essentially life. It's a life-destroying, catastrophic um, event for you. This makes it really hard to kind of re-enter normal life even after you know getting out okay hypertexting so hypertexting so americans send it's unbelievable sixty-nine thousand texts a second with over six billion texts sent per day now, the younger a person is the more texts they send so users between the ages of 18 and 24 send an average of 109 and a half texts a day and more than 3200 a month while now boys and girls, you know, they text at the same frequency, the girls tend to have more of an emotional, psychological attachment to texting behavior. And because of that, they can tend to have a little bit more of a difficulty controlling it. So, again, just like addiction, like an alcoholic or, a, you know, drinking too much or actually being an alcoholic, there's a difference between just sending a large amount of texts and then there's compulsive texting, right? So one is more abusive, one can equate to addiction. So if, in a, like with alcohol, if one, if one person drinks, let's say two people drink the same amount, for instance, but one is unable to, to cut back or they start lying about how much they're drinking, that would be the more serious drinking problem. So compulsive texters, surprise, have higher risk of other impulse control behaviors, such as trying a drug, multiple sexual partners, abusing alcohol, those kind of things. Technoference. So everyday interferences and intrusions from mobile phone use. So technoference, a new, a, another word, I didn't put it in, this, in the talk, uh, it's called fubbing and it's called phone snubbing. So if someone is talking to you, you're engaged in a conversation with someone, and then all of a sudden their phone, they get a notification and while they're talking to you, they go and they start and they look down at it. That's the new word is called fubbing. So your phone snubbing that person. You're basically telling that person without saying it that whatever's going on in their device in the phone is more important than the current conversation they're having with you. So in a recent Australian study, men and women reported using phones as a coping strategy rather than deal with more pressing issues. 
Um, I've been there before, actually. One in five women and one in eight men now lose sleep due to the time they spend on their phones. And I will actually go over some slides uh, on sleep in just a second here. 14% of women and 8.5% of men try to hide the amount of time they actually spend on their phone. And 8.4% of women and 7.9% of men attribute daily aches and pains to mobile phone use. So screens and depression. Most studies back up the theory that as social media and technology have made us more connected, we're actually becoming more depressed. Aside from the potential for increased anxiety and depression from too much social media, other uh, recent clinical research is linking depression to increased internet use. So just not necessarily being on Instagram or Facebook, but just increased internet use in general. Uh, a 1998 Carnegie Mellon University study found that web use over a two-year period was linked to increased depression, loneliness, and the loss of real-world friends. Social media, such as Facebook and Instagram, uh, it can temporarily relieve loneliness that a person may feel, but it's not going to it's not going to get to the underlying need for real-world communication. With lack of real-world friendships and peer interaction, the dependence on the phone and internet will actually grow and you'll feel more dependent on it, which leads into a vicious cycle of, you know, being on it more because you feel like you need it more. But as you're on it more, you're losing real world communication and interaction. And so just as the cycle continues, a 2014 study in the journal Comprehensive Psychology looked at 2,293 seventh graders and found that internet addiction exacerbated depression, hostility, and social anxiety. <laughs> So less social, more media. We're social creatures by nature. We need human connection. We have to have it. It's, it, it's crucial for us. For a conversation to have social relevance, 70% of the time, you have to have eye contact. Today's adolescents maintain eye contact 20 to 30% of the time. They're being trained almost by using their devices so much, actually like detraining them to make eye contact. 2.8. Two seven billion people are on Facebook, and what we what we see with things like Facebook and um, Instagram is people putting their idealized image on there. So, in other words, I give the I give the uh, analogy of cleaning your house up. I think I went over this with Jimmy. Uh, cleaning your house up, you know, to have some friends over for a get together, like a Thanksgiving or a holiday or what have you. Your house doesn't really look like as clean as you just made it. It's kind of a mess, and our lives, for the most part, are kind of a mess. You know, we have kids and wives and just conflicts at work and everything. And except, you know, when it comes to social media, it's like, well, I don't want to put the mess on there. Let's put the perfect picture and try to get it just right. And then, you know, other people may see that and go, wow, they look like they have the perfect family. They have the, they have the best vacation. Why, why does my life suck, you know? And make that person feel depressed and lonely. And it's just a... It's really not a natural thing for us, but um, being aware that that social media can really put a false image of what your life is all about on there for people to see. Okay, so text neck. So this is basically the person that's looking down. Um, this is really becoming a problem. I'm, uh, so what I do, I'm a chiropractor by trade, and. Um, I started seeing several years ago, um, many kids starting to come in, um, get more than normal. And I was like, what's going on? And, and we started, I just started looking at it more and it was, you know, really being on devices and keeping your neck and your chin pulled down, puts a ton of stress on, you know, the spinal structures in your upper back and your neck, give you pain down the arms, shoulder pain, elbow pain, wrist pain, hand pain, uh, headaches, all kinds of stuff. So um, they actually named, they named it text neck. It's an actual, that's what it's called. So you can, uh, it's becoming a bigger problem actually, um, nationwide, worldwide. Okay. I'm going to skip that slide. So symptoms, uh, associated with text neck, uh, neck pain, again, like I said, headaches, upper back pain, wrist and elbow pain, numbness and tingling in the hands and fingers and burning down the arms it's consistent with a carpal tunnel type of, uh, syndrome. Children are especially susceptible uh, to postural distortions because, you know, they lack the postural awareness and body awareness and coordination that adults have developed. So, 
you know, that you can see, I mean, you see kids all the time, they're, they're you know, contorted on the couch, laying down on their back, looking at the phone or whatever. Um, and, you know, in addition, few schools have any sort of ergonomic training in place to actually teach kids, you know, they're issuing tablets, but not really teaching you ergonomics. There is ergonomics associated with using these devices. Okay. So sleep and insomnia. So I'll go over these briefly, um, not get too deep into it. Um, Sleep-wake cycle affects nearly every aspect of human physiology, including brainwave patterns, immune function, hormone regulation, cell regulation, and metabolism. So basically everything. Two-process model of sleep regula regulation, it was first described by Dr. Alexander Borbali about three decades ago. And that changed the way you know, the world understood sleep regulation. And that's actually process involved in it. So I'm going to kind of give you a generic kind of a 30,000 foot view of sleep regulation. So two process sleep model is what Dr. Borbali kind of proposed. And it's basically stuck around since he proposed it. Um, you have sleep pressure and wake drive. Once it's um, process S and process C, if you really want to look it up, um, I just go over it. Sleep wake, pressure, wake drive is a little bit more easy to understand, I think, even though it can be hard to understand. So when you basically when you wake up in the morning, there's a pressure to sleep that starts and that pressure builds until the time you fall asleep at night. And once you're asleep, the pressure drops and then you wake up in the morning. So now wake drive is also initiated in the morning. So wake drive is a 24 hour rhythm, which cycles in a circadian, circadian rhythm in accordance with a light dark cycle over 24 hour period. Wake drive will overcome sleep pressure as you move towards the morning and it pushes you awake essentially. Okay, so both of these systems are working throughout the day at the same time. So the big difference is sleep pressure is a homeostatic uh, mechanism and it's basically, it's based on when you go to sleep and when you wake up. Wake drive is separate in that it's set by a 24 hour circadian rhythm, which is set by light entering the eye. And this is important to understand the distinction. So the, ideally, let's just say hypothetically, you wake up at 6 a.m., wake drive is initiated and your sleep pressure also begins to build. So wake drive will continue to rise all day to counter the rising sleep pressure to go to sleep. And it hits its peak, let's just say around 9 p.m. Wake drive will then drop to almost nothing by 10 o'clock when the mounting sleep pressure will make you groggy and kind of ready to go to sleep. And this is ideally how this will work. And you would wake up at 6 a.m. the next morning, you repeat the same cycle over and over. Um, um, you know, the, the important thing is to realize that wake drive can be pushed forwards or backwards, depending on how much light exposure and when you're getting your light exposure. So as mentioned earlier, wake drive is circadian rhythm, and it's set by the amount and the hue of the light entering the eye. So let's just go over this really quickly. It's just a little anatomy. Um, at least there's no math. The pineal gland, which is known as the third eye, kind of right behind the eyeballs, like way back into the brain. It's a tiny organ um, several inches behind the eyes. Pineal gland is responsible for synthesizing and, and secreting melatonin, which is a hormone responsible, at least partially responsible for regulating your circadian rhythm, your kind of your 24 hour cycle. Melatonin synthesized from the precursor serotonin, which is synthesized from the amino acid tryptophan. So light er, er, enters the eye, is exposed to the retina. The retina then relays this information to what's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's an area of the hypothalamus, which basically is in charge of coordinating your biological clock on a daily basis. So now the signal de de uh, descends down the spinal cord to the superior cervical ganglion and back up to the pineal gland. Now, the secretion of melatonin is strongly connected to light exposure with almost no melatonin being released um, you know, during the daylight hours. And then you get a rapid spike at night in the dark. So, OK, I kind of went over that pretty fast. Um, there's a ton of information on this whole system and whole cycle out there. Um, and you can learn a lot about it. It's pretty important to kind of have an understanding of it. So now that we know light exposure is a key factor in setting our circadian rhythm, 
let's just make sense of everything. So in our modern society, we spend much more time indoors than we used to years ago, thousands of years ago, under you know less intense lighting than outdoor lighting. And our rhythm depends on bright light exposure early in the day to help anchor that wake drive, which keeps us on a certain cycle. This can shift the wake drive forward, which is made use by our extended use of artificial light when it's dark outside. We kind of just keep turning lights on and keep things going. To compound things further, we're getting a significant amount of exposure to what's known as blue light, which is actually a, not blue at all. It's, it's invisible. Um, it sounds weird. It's invisible and it's so bad for you, you know. Um, but this is a shorter wavelength of light. And it has a very, blue light in particular has a very potent melatonin suppressing effect. Blue light, of course, commonly found in backlit screens, computers, TVs, smartphones, iPads, tablets, you know, all of it, all of all the screens. Um, low levels of melatonin decreased by blue light exposure is, is associated with subjective sleeplessness. Even worse, melatonin suppression has been shown to increase the risk of cancer, Im impair your immune function, associated with cardiometabolic disturbances like type 2 diabetes, obesity, heart disease, metabolic syndrome. So basically everything that's bad, uh, melatonin, it will result in melatonin su suppression. It's been associated with it. In addition to blue light, even normal room light exposure for up to one hour can bring melatonin back to daytime levels. Just one hour of daily exposure to light. So how do you know if you need a digital detox? So this is kind of you know pulling back from the phones or pulling back from our devices. So it kind of, it's, it's interesting. It kind of is the same criteria for uh, ADHD. So for instance, do you have difficulty maintaining attention if someone's talking to you directly, uh, do you have difficulty organizing tasks? Are you, you know, do you avoid tasks that require sustained focus? Um, are you easily distracted by a stimulus such as like an email notification or a text message? And you know, the key to, you know, optimal performance in just about anything is that ability to control where our attention is directed, and it's just so important uh, to have that attention directed and focused. Okay, so just like any addiction, um, drug, tech, whatever, the addict must first do a detox before any other therapy can be effective. So a full digital detox would eliminate all computers, tablets, video game systems, and smartphones. And if you want to go really strict uh, digital detox, um, eliminates television as well as the other things. Prescribed time is four to six weeks, um, which is, again, the time it takes to reset a hyper-aroused nervous system. Again, as I mentioned before, Dr. Kadaris runs a couple tech uh, tech rehab centers, I think one in uh, Hawaii and then in Austin, um, and this is kind of what he's prescribing. Most effective way is not cold turkey. This can trigger explosive behavior, so sometimes you have to just kind of stair-step it down to get yourself, you know, uh, on a detox, gradual reduction of an hour a day. So, you know, just again, if you're on five hours a day, go down to four and then three and, and to the point where you re reach abstinence. And once you hit abstinence, you remain screen free for that four to six weeks rather than just going, Hey, you know what? You're playing those games too much. I'm taking the, I'm taking the console away from you. And that's that. And that can actually, that has been actually, some anecdotes of um, that going really sideways. Okay, chiropractic. So this is what I do. What's chiropractic? Um, based on two principles, the body is a self-healing organism and the nervous system is a master system in the human body. Easy way to look at it. An overlooked component of optimal health and wellness is having and maintaining a healthy spine and nervous system. Healing occur occurs from above, down, and inside out. So we can we have this ability to heal ourselves, right? Body, we say that the body doesn't need much help healing. It just needs no interference with the process. Regular or maintenance chiropractic care um, helps reinforce good postural awareness, relieves numbness in the extremities, can help eliminate and relieve and manage uh, you know, neck, upper back pain uh, from prolonged sitting and text neck. Okay. So what's the recommendations on how much screen use is safe for my kids, you know? 
American Academy of Pediatrics uh, recommends uh, no screen media for children under the age of two, um, with the exception of video chatting. So nothing under the age of two. So that's that's pretty. They're pretty clear with it. For ages two to five, they recommend one hour a day or one hour or less per day of high quality programming. So, um, so basically, from zero to age five less than an hour a day of any sort of and and only high quality stuff right for ages six and older uh, place placing consistent limits on screen uh, media not letting it interfere with sleep exercise or other healthy activities so you know it's like people go well how do i know what's a problem and what's not a problem and the thing is is like if you have a, a kid even a you know a kid and a teenager and all of a sudden it's they, they were really into let's say football or baseball or basketball or some activity and now you're seeing that they're losing an interest in that and they're kind of spending more and more time talking or texting or playing a game or whatever um, i would say that that would be a pretty safe time to say hey we need to reevaluate our our limits on screen limitation um, so designate uh, media free times like obviously driving um or you know like dinner you know don't no phones at the dinner table for instance you know don't bring your phone to the dinner table we're gonna have a we're gonna talk or we're gonna just do nothing just sit there and focus on your meal you know uh not meal and then play on your phone at the same time designate media free zones in the house like the bedroom or dinner table i think the bedroom is a big one um, a lot of people get in bed um, i've been guilty of it many times and you get to bed, you're half, you're pretty, you're about half asleep, and you lay down, and then you pick up your phone and start checking emails or start playing around on it. Um, it can really disrupt sleep. Um, let's see. Look for signs of addictive or overuse behavior. This is sort of a potpourri of tips. Um, move your uh, device to look at it. So I think I went over this again in the the. Um, talk that Jimmy and I just our chat we had but you know take the phone and, and move it up don't move your head down so that's the way you should do it or lay on your back and hold your you know, hold your phone up so you support your neck filter your uh, blue light on your devices with um, I use f.lux on my computers so PCs or Macs it works for both of them it's a free program runs in the background and kind of dims and filters blue light in accordance with um, you set it to your the, the time it's super easy to set up takes five minutes um, super easy to use uh, set that on computers and laptops um, use night shift on your iPhone or I think it's called Twilight for Android um, again those aren't perfect um, divide you know filtering night sh night shift and things like that you know better to actually get the blue light filtering you know glasses um, those are much more effective but if you at least you can do is you can you know filter it with the night shift right this is a, an interesting one put black electrical tape over your laptop camera um, it's there's some I think there's some um, you know spyware malware and things that can hijack the camera and kind of look around in the room and who knows uh, that might be no good <laughs> cut the plug off this is another one if you have an old uh, computer that has like a headphone jack they say cut off the plug from an old headphones and actually plug it in that microphone jack and that will disable the external microphone so sometimes there's again programs that can be running on a computer that pick up the sound and maybe someone's listening to your conversations or maybe you're giving out sensitive information you don't want to have heard um, so hackers are getting really good at getting into your stuff recognize the difference between digital vegetable vegetables and digital candy so digital candy is like you know just facebook and you know social media and stuff like that and digital vegetables will be like maybe research or something that you're looking up that's you know educational in nature practice mindful meditation that's a that's an easy one easy as in there's lots of um ways to find mindful meditation online um hard and finding the discipline and the time to actually do it and do it consistently um I like the Wim Hof method. Uh, Wim Hof has a great app um, that you download and do the, the breathing exercises. I find that it's very, very effective. I really enjoy doing it. Set a time of day when you set aside time for checking email and social media. So not a rolling 
you know, ticker all day where you're just constantly checking your email, just say, hey, you know, from six to seven in the morning or seven to eight or whatever it may be, or at night, that's when I'm going to do my social media and check in on an email. And if you could develop some discipline with that, consistency with that, it really helps. <clears throat> look at a distant spot for every 20 minutes looking at a screen. So you stare at your screen for every 20 minutes, look, kind of look down and that and stare at a distant spot it helps with the eye strain. Download a screen time tracking app. Uh, my favorite is Moment. Uh, Moment is great for you know getting a real world look and trying to really holding yourself accountable. And wow, I just spent three hours on my phone today or whatever it may be. Clean and organize your phone. <clears throat> so get rid of your slot machine apps, the ones that just suck you in and just keep going on them. Like an Instagram is like a slot machine app. You just you, you know just the scroll never stops, right? Consolidate your black hole apps into folders and get them off your home screen. So this has been really effective if you take like, let's just say Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, you've spent a lot of time on those, throw them in a folder and put the folder on like way deep into your phone. And it, believe it or not, you'll actually, and if you use something like Moment, you'll actually track and see how much you're actually looking at those things. Um, and the deeper you bury them on there, the less you look at them, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, right? So use your lock screen as a reminder. So you can actually take a picture of something you know, or take a picture that says, uh, or write on a piece of paper, um, hey, stop looking at your phone and then take a picture of it and save it as your wallpaper. And so when you slide, get ready to open your phone, you look at it and it goes, oh, stop looking at your phone. And you can kind of think, hey, do I need to be on my phone right now? Or am I just doing it because I'm bored or you know, I have some downtime at it, but maybe you don't even, just, you know, as a way of kind of minimizing the amount of exposure you have on your phone. Get an alarm clock and chain and charge your device in a different room from where you're sleeping. So people always say, oh, I got to have my phone in my bedroom on my nightstand because I use it for my alarm clock. And it's like, mm, that's kind of like a junkie talking. Take your phone, <laughs> put it in another room and then go buy a $5 alarm clock from somewhere and just Use that for your alarm clock, old school ways. Um, put your phone out of reach while driving. This is a great tip. Um, it's harder than you think, if you're, especially if you're using, you know, you, you talk through your Bluetooth or you're using your GPS or whatever, but if you actually put it away from where you can't touch it, you'll just try it and you'll go, it, you'll be surprised. Like when you're driving, like, oh my God, I'm looking for my phone. And it's, it's kind of, you don't realize it until you actually try it. Download an app blocker, another trick, uh, such as Freedom uh, for Apple users or Off Time for Android users. You actually block yourself from looking at apps. It's really you know, crazy how we have to discipline ourselves. Okay, so resources. I put a, a few resources up on here. You can look these up. Again, Glow Kids, um, a great book. Um, a lot of my material has been derived from some of the work uh, uh, Nicholas Cardaris has done. It's been, it's, it's really eye opening. Um, Digital Citizens Academy.org, uh, DCA.org is a great resource. Um, NetAddictionRecovery.com, ScreenAgers.com. Um, good stuff there. And thank you for attending. Thank you for listening. Um, technology is not going to go away, so we got to use it safely. You know, learn how to use it safely and responsibly because it's not going to go away. It's just going to become more in, in, involved in our lives. So education is key. Um, we really understand what we're doing and how much time we're spending. Um, and try doing this digital de detox and a digital fast. You know, see how you feel. Like, start just like don't take your phone to work one day or something like that and just you know, to see, you know, you'll notice a difference in productivity. Um, if you found this information useful, please contact me. Gladly present this talk. I do it at schools, businesses. I can do Zoom with it, what have you. And that